and okay and cool okay hello everyone i'm elliot and i'm going to be basically continuing the story that we're talking about over the last couple of weeks um and what i'm going to be talking about this week is pigs bundles and their connection to mirror symmetry and eventually how that corresponds to the geometric Langlands program. So let me just start by summarizing basically what I'm going to be going through. So I'll start with a little bit of a review of the stuff that Stephen and Sid talked about, just, just enough to get our bearings so that you know we, we know where we're trying to go. So talking about what the geometric Langlands conjecture actually is, and then what S duality is. And then I'm going to be basically compactifying our S duality in four dimensions to two dimensions, which will give us a Hitchin moduli space. And that has mirror symmetry, which is interesting. So let's get started. Geometric Langlands conjecture. So basically, the Langlands conjecture is this correspondence, and it's sort of number three word is basically an arithmetic side and an automorphic side. And in the classical sense, um, the most classical version, the arithmetic side is corresponds to the Galois group, uh, basically a representation of the Galois group of a field extension uh, to the Langlands dual of the group G that you care about. Now this has a nice geometric interpretation because of basically the reinterpret, we can reinterpret the Galois group as the fundamental group. So the way this, um, Stephen talked about this in a much more like highbrow algebraic geometry sort of way, but you can just see this already in the case of basically polynomials, where you look at the field extensions defined by a given polynomial, and those actually correspond exactly with the, with the coverings you get over the Riemann surface by that polynomial. So in this case, we have um, Z, which gives us a two-sheeted covering, and and we can see that this two-sheeted covering that is, corresponds to basically the Galois group of Z2, right? So then we, equivalently to this thing, we can instead define uh, just a representation of pi one uh, into our into the Langlands dual of our group. So that is by the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence, that's characterized by flat bundles. So flat bundles is one thing we care about. What's the other thing? Well, automorphic forms are basically um, spectral theory, representation theory. So we're considering this double coset space of group G, a modest maximal uh, compact subgroup, and then also model lattice. So the usual case of this is just basically the upper half plane, which you can realize as a symmetric space, and then mod SL2Z. And then we're looking at L2 functions on that, and eigenfunctions of those, and so on and so forth. I mean, if you really like physics, you can think of this as studying the quantum mechanics of a particle on a locally symmetric space. Anyway, the, the connection with, um, with geometry comes in the Weyl uniformization theorem, which kind of relates this double coset space with the space of all bundles, the space of all G bundles. And then the, the, in the geometric Langlands correspondence, what this gives us is D modules on on G. And this sounds complicated, but it's really just basically, it's basically a structure that can be differentiated over one G. That's all that says. So this, this relation between the three different areas, like the, is this is this is Wiles Rosetta Stone that he loves to talk about. Um, and then interrelating the two of them is Hecke stuff. So in the classical sense, these are Hecke eigenfunctions, and they generalize the Hecke eigensheafs. So We'll come back to that more next week. But now let's talk about S duality, which is what Sid talked about last week. So let me just try to set the scene and give, a, give the mathematical background that the, the, the frame that we're working in. So we're on a principle, oops, we're on a principle G bundle, call it P on a four manifold M and the fields we're considering are just G connections. So this, we're going to denote this as a space of connections. And recall that the connections are actually an affine space based on the vector space of 
adjoint valued one forms. So when I say adjoint valued one forms, I mean um, se sections of the one of the canonical bundle tensored with tensored with the adjoint bundle. When the adjoint bundle is the bundle associated to the adjoint representation. It's just basically a bundle where the fibers are the Lie algebra, and you demand that when you act on gauge transformations, act on this by gauge transformations, it transforms under the adjoint. So that's our setup, and we're considering the Yang Mills stuff, Yang Mills action, which has two terms. Um, basically, this term is the Yang Mills term. It corresponds to effectively the norm squared of the curvature of our connection. And we have this topological term over here. And in front of each of these terms, we have a coupling constant, which determines basically the strength of the associated interaction. And it's going to be convenient to package this all up into one nice complex coupling constant. Okay, now we take n equal four supersymmetry. So Sid did this by basically taking n equal one supersymmetry on 10 D space and then dimensionally reducing. But you can, you can do it in a bunch of different ways, but basically the effect of it is we introduce a bunch of extra fields and symmetries. So the one that's actually gonna be relevant to us is this field phi, which we're gonna call the Higgs field. Um, and this takes, this takes values in adjoint valued one forms. So if we're looking at the, the space of, basically the space of uh, fields that we care about is gauge fields and then Higgs fields, but because this is a vector space based on this very same guy, we can just identify this with the cotangent bundle of the space of connections. So that's what our fields are taking values in. And we do a topological twist that converts this into a TFT, which is an important part of the story that I'm not covering. Now, what the, the, the amazing thing is basically this S-duality that we're talking about which first manifested, you can for, it was foreseen as Montan and Olive duality. And what it basically says is in this N equal four super Yang Mills case, you have an exact equivalence of the quantum theories of, uh, of G and tau with the Langlands group of G and one over tau. Now, this is weird because Langlands is a number theorist. He's not a physicist. So what's his name doing in here? Why is there the Langlands group? I mean, you can answer just in terms of co-roots or something like that, but surely there's a deeper thing going on here between this and the Langlands correspondence, because after all, there are no coincidences. So basically our goal as physicists studying mathematics, we're trying to basically see if we can derive the expression of the Langlands correspondence from this S-duality, from this mountain and all of duality. And hopefully this will give us a new perspective on Langlands duality, which will be useful for um, number theory stuff. Um, so the first step of this is, well, Langlands duality is about studying things over curves, which are two dimensional, but this is a four dimensional space, which means we have to cut off a couple of those dimensions. That's called we can use a trick called compactification. So let's suppose our manifold splits into two parts, some, some surface that may or may not be closed. I don't know, let's just pretend it's R2 or something. Right. And then a compact Riemann surface. Um, so the space of fields, again, we're considering is from this, big, this total manifold, this product of these two things to the cotangent space of connections on this manifold. And then we're gonna we're gonna do a little trick, which is basically is basically currying, um, but we're gonna split this function up into a function from sigma to the space of functions from c to the space of fields. And <clears throat> with this with this being done, now our the question is: Can we reduce this this guy here? Can we reduce it somehow to just fields on c? Because if we did that, then this part here, this doesn't have anything to do with sigma, which means that this space is fixed, which means that basically we're considering a sigma model from sigma to some fixed space of fields. And the idea for how to do this is to basically 
make the energy of, of this guy, make it totally dominated by this part here. So dominated that basically any of the action effects from, from the other part, from the sigma in this guy here, don't matter at all. So we're thinking about this as basically high and low energy dimensions. We're considering the sigma as a low energy and the C is where we want it to be high energy. Um, and then the idea is when we take a low energy approximation of this, this all integrates out. And instead of having a four dimensional theory, we have a two dimensional theory. So this is the dimensional reduction. So this is actually totally, totally reasonable from a physical perspective. Like this is how I like to think about it. To ants, the world is totally two dimensional for all intents and purposes. That is until they get into a high speed collision and then fly off into the third dimension. So basically, um, they only saw this extra dimension when their energy was high enough. We can think of this extra dimension as just another degree of freedom whose energy is so high that we can't excite it. Um, we don't excite it in, in normal life. But when we go to higher energies, we can see these higher dimensions. Um, now let's be a little bit more precise about how to actually do this compactification. How do we manifest this um, separation of energies on our C part and our sigma part? This is a little hint right here, but let's look at our action. So this is me writing out the action, writing out in quotes because I'm leaving off the hundreds of other terms of the other supersymmetric fields that, I don't know. Anyway, the essential part is this guy here. Right, so the action is the sum of squares. So here you have your yin mills term, which is just for the curvature, the, the square of the curvature. And then your Higgs, your Higgs field also looks like um, the square of a derivative. And the point is being basically that this is a sum of squares, which means that we can kind of split apart our M into sigma and C and look at the actions individually on sigma and c. And there are still cross terms, but the point is these cross terms are always positive. And since these are sums of squares, these are all going to be positive. And basically the net effect is we have this bounding of the action. And in particular, bounding of the action by a c. Now, what we do is we take the volume of c to go to zero. So we shrink it. This is what physicists say when they mean compactification or like bundling up dimensions into a little space. They just mean, they just mean taking a metric and shrinking it. I didn't understand that for the longest time. But um, the point is using a physicist's favorite pastime, some dimensional analysis, we can see that uh, the action scales inversely with basically the metric, which means that as we take our volume to be zero, where actually the, the action goes to infinity. And since our total action is bound, by, bound from below by the sky, this means that any time this is non-zero, if we take the limit as the C part goes to be really, really small, this will totally dominate and it will basically kill everything else. Um, the net effect of this is basically the thing we care about ultimately in our quantum theory is our path integral. And all of this stuff, basically this, this thing, in the limit of volume goes to zero, this localizes to the points where the action on C is minimized, specifically it takes the minimal possible value of zero. So what, what we've done is we've started from just, you know, like a sigma model on our four manifold and we've use this trick and we have an effective low energy model, which instead of being on a four manifold is on our two manifold sigma. And now the values it takes because we know that basically we can cut out everything that isn't in the level set of, of SC. It takes values in, in this guy. This is basically the space of classical vacuums of, of our theory. Now, what makes this extra cool is it's a little trick, another little trick. Our TFT was topological, QFT was topological from that twist we did at the beginning, which means that it doesn't depend on metric. 
So if this is how it behaves in the limit as the metric gets really, really small, then that means that this is how it, it has to behave all the time, right? This is basically saying like the semi-classical approximation that we're doing here is actually exact. And this does totally describe our topological quantum field theory. So where are we at now? Well, we have essentially, if you solve these action equations, you get a system in, of these, these three equations. It's basically a, it's an elliptic PDE in phi and A. So you have the curvature minus the wedge of, the, of our Higgs field with itself. And then we also have that the Higgs field is harmonic. So this is our space of classical vacua. The moduli space of solutions to these equations is our space of vacua. So instead of, oops, instead of being Instead of being over sigma cross C, we basically split C down here and lying over it is now the space of solutions. It's the Hitchin moduli space. This guy right here is going to, this, this is our protagonist for today. Um, the reason why she looks a little uh, shifty is that, well, she, she has many faces and she goes by many names and we're going to meet quite a few of them today. So, to actually get a handle on the geometry of this moduli space, I'm going to construct these equations in a different way. And that is going to be using basically a hypercalar quotient. So hypercalar, um, let me just first mention we're looking at the, the our space of fields is the cotangent space to the space of connections. And if we want, we can just kind of treat this this other part of it as, as like a complex vector. So we can treat this equivalently as the space of complex connections. This is going to be a nice thing to have in our back pocket later on. So again, our space splits into the connections and then sort of the cotangent fiber representing the Higgs bundles. Now, this is cool because there's a couple natural structures you can put on this. First off, it is a cotangent bundle. So it has a canonical symplectic form. Um, basically, that, uh, if we consider A as the position and, and, and phi as the momentum, this is dp wedge d, d, dq wedge dp. That's all this is here. And this gives a symplectic form i. But the space we started with, the space of connections, is already a Kähler manifold. And this is basically the space of connections on a surface has a natural symplectic structure. This is called the Atiyah-Bott structure, but it's pretty much the only thing you can imagine. Basically, you take a, it's a one it's an adjoint valued one form. You take it wedge itself, and you get a two form. You use a, some sort of bilinear form to, to to get rid of the ad to get rid of the Lie algebra stuff, and yeah, you're left with the symplectic form. So. We have two natural holomorphic symplectic forms on this space. Now, let's let's do some more stuff with it. When I say they're holomorphic symplectic forms, what I mean is that there's actually complex structures on this space for which they are holomorphic. And in fact, the complex structures are pretty much also the most natural complex structures you can think of. So for, for this guy, for the cotangent bundle, we have using this identification here. We just think of this as multiplication by i, which is obviously, um, which is obviously complex, right? Um, and then for the for the Atiyah bot form, instead with our complex structure j is just going to be interchanged fields and add a negative. So basically, i and j are prescribed two different ways to rotate from your space of connections into your space of Higgs fields, and vice versa. And these glue together to give a hyperkiller structure. So what that means is you have you have your complex structures i and j, but also the product of them is another complex structure, and in fact these form a representation of the quaternion algebra. See right here, and what's so cool about that is that you actually get not just like three complex structures, you get a whole sphere of them. Right, so this is basically the you take the imaginary part of the of the of quaternions and just look at the unit sphere bundle in that, and this is the space of complex structures. So we have a natural CP one family of complex structures, and I say complex structures, not almost complex structures, because again, this is a flat space, 
and these are totally linear complex structures here, so they're automatically integrable. So we don't have to, we don't even have to check the hardest part. And because again, this has a metric, um, that means that we can correspond these complex structures to symplectic structures in the normal way you do with Kähler geometry. And down here we see we can combine again these symplectic structures, these real symplectic structures, into the holomorphic ones we had earlier, which are kind of like complex versions of it. So it's just each one is, oops, each one is, you know, some of the other two. That's the idea of that and com and uh, cyclic permutations. So I'm going to give a little bit of a like a really quick review of some symplectic geometry stuff that we're going to need going forward. So. Just as a reminder, so symplectic form is a closed non-degenerate two form, and we're gonna be using it in the context of basically Hamiltonian mechanics, where the symplectic form basically is a prescription of how to rotate from the gradient of a Hamiltonian to one which is pair, which is tangent to the level set. So by, by taking the interior derivative with the, with the symplectic form in this vector field, basically, the net effect, you can think of the symplectic form as prescribing a way to turn a uh, gradient of a Hamiltonian to a flow that preserves energy. That is the basis of Hamiltonian dynamics. Question is, what happens when there's symmetries? So what a, a symmetry is a, it's a lead group action of G on M that we demand, we demand that it preserves the structure we care about, the symplectic structure. And infinitesimally, this takes the form that the, the, the flows, the individual flows, corresponding to like the Lie algebra of G, the integral flows of that have to all be induced by Hamiltonians. It's just the infinitesimal version of the symplectic condition. So if they're induced by Hamiltonians, what are the Hamiltonians? There's kind of only one thing it can be based on like linearity concerns on the Lie algebra. We have to define a moment map. So for each point on our manifold, we define an element of dual of the Lie algebra. And then basically the flow for any given Lie algebra is gonna be generated by just taking, taking that dual and like inner, product, inner producting it with that, right? Now we can consider, let's, let's, let's choose a basis of our Lie algebra and then this basically gives us a family of n different Hamiltonians that all commute with each other. And by the G invariance of, of H of our normal Hamiltonian, we get that the Hamiltonian actually is a, well, it's preserved under all of these, which means it preserves all of these. What that effectively means is that this mu is a conserved quantity under the flow. And that's, it's, 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 it's the momentum. That's why we called it the momentum map in the first place. So basically that means that any dynamics are going to have to live on a level set of, of our moment map. But we haven't even actually taken the, the we haven't even modded out by the symmetry yet. We want to identify all points on a given G orbit, right? So then the, the step is the step is declare one. Let's just take a given level set of the moment map, one that's for, one that has nice properties, and then let's mod out by G. And this basically this we're left with a we're left with a single little sub manifold here. This basically we've modded out by all the effective symmetries of our system, and this is the minimal dynamics of this system that we care about. This is called the symplectic quotient, and basically, the notable thing is that we've we've, we've reduced by twice the amount that we would naively expect. That's that's kind of cool, but it's even better when you have three symplectic forms. So this is the hyperkähler place, and we're, we're interested in taking the hyperkähler quotient of the space we were talking about earlier. Well, okay, so what's actually the symmetry of the space? What's the Lie group acting on it? That's the group of gauge transformations, whereby a gauge transformation, I just mean an automorphism of the bundle that is trivial on the base. So a set effectively, it's the same as just taking, it's just rotating uh, rotating the fibers by a specific amount at each point. That's a gauge transformation. And the Lie algebra for a gauge transformation, an infinitesimal gauge transformation, is just a vertical vector field. And we can consider that as, you know, like a, a section of the adjoint bundle. And our moment maps that we care about have to be in the dual of this Lie algebra, but 
again, we're on a surface, so we could just use Poincaré duality, and and that's just a that's just a two form that's also valued in the adjoint in the adjoints. So you can work it out, and you actually find that these are the moment maps for the free um, for the free symplectic forms that we get earlier with the i and the j and the k structure. And these are all these are all both basically these are two form equations, right? These are so they're they are living in the space as we want. And if you notice, these are exactly the equations that we set to zero in our original definition of Hitchens equations, which so is basically this is this is a rephrasing of the same. We we got back what we wanted. And then what we're going to consider is the hyperkähler quotient. So instead of just taking one level set, these are all preserved under each other. So we can take all three at once and then mod that out by G. And this is a, a really cool trick. And this is why we went through this whole hyperkähler construction is that there's actually different ways to look at this guy. So we can do that by reducing effectively in stages. Instead of taking all three of these at once and then modding out by G, we, we can restrict to just the level set of two of them, and we're left with a Kähler manifold. And then we do normal Kähler reduction on that guy, and that does this part here, that does the remainder of it. So, well, so to see this in action, let's consider one of the one of the symplectic forms that from, from the other page, let's consider the Atiyah bot form. And naturally, the the moment of this is just a complex sum of the, of the different moments because that's because this is a holomorphic symplectic form. It's the sum of other other real symplectic forms. But this was just the Atiyah bot form, and what Atiyah bot noticed actually is that with this form on the space of connections, the moment map of gate transforms is just it's just the curvature. That's it. Um, and in this case, because we're doing if we have all this extra complex stuff going on, we get the curvature of basically the complex bundle. So when we first, or when we first, we're going to reduce to to the level set of i and k at once. And because of this, Elliot, I think there's a typo there. I think the, I think the first, the real part should be mu sub j instead of mu sub k. Of the real part. Yeah. Then. Um. If you want to get the complex curvature. Sorry, shouldn't it be the other two? Like it's this is J, so it's K and I. Or um, I don't know. You're probably right. It's if you if you want to get the curvature of the complex connection, it's the it's it in, should involve mu sub i and mu sub j. Okay. It shouldn't involve the metric. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So basically, the point of all of this is by by we've reduced effectively to the space of flat flat bundles, to the space of flat connections, and then we when we do our Kähler reduction, we have this this space has naturally this complex structure J sitting on it. And when we do Kähler reduction on that, we get a complex structure on the result. That's J. Now we can do the same thing with our other thing that we care about, I. So in this case, um, for for the moment of I to be zero, that shouldn't say mu I omega I is zero. It should say the moment of I is zero. Then what we're looking for is these two guys up here to be zero. This is just a condition that phi is harmonic which equivalently says the zero one part of phi is holomorphic. So we can identify this naturally with the space of what we're calling Higgs bundles, which are just basically a bundle P and an adjoint value one form that is holomorphic. That's our Higgs field. And we can see what's going on in this little picture here. So we have our total space of cotangent space of connections and we have two different ways of reducing our system one is we look at the space of Higgs bundles. The other is we look at the space of flat connections and they intersect exactly in the solution of all three of these, exactly in the solution of Hitchens equations. So we get sitting in here after we model by gauge transforms, we get our Hitchens moduli space again in, in different form this time.
It's a lot more snake-like. So, what's cool about this, these two structures that we had is that they gave us two totally different ways of looking at the same space. And they naturally gave us two different complex structures on the space. So, we can actually, we, this is basically the same moduli space of Higgs bundles, but looked at same moduli space of Higgs bundles over the same curve, but looked at from these two different perspectives. So they have these two different structures, right? So these take the form of basically singular manifolds. Um, and on the left here, we have flat G connections, which is, you know, thinking back to, um, back to, to Stephen's talk, this is just the local systems, right? This is, this is one half of the geometric Lingland's correspondence. And on the other side, we have moduli of Higgs bundles, where a Higgs field is just a, it's just a holomorphic adjoint value one form. But then we can just do a little bit of manipulation, um, pull that down here, do Sarah duality, and we get that this, the space of these is equivalent to the space of each one of these adjoint forms. And it turns out this is exactly like this is the space of different, this is the deformation space of bundles, which kind of makes sense because you have an H1 here that you usually see that popping up in deformation spaces. So um, on this side, we get bungee, which is, as we remember, this is the other part of Langman's correspondence that we care about. Sorry. Right? So this. Mm -hmm. Just one question. So this GC, um, what does that mean? So that is the complexification of the group G. Wow. So I, I, I'm, I'm saying, I think I started with like a real group and we're looking at a complex group. I, this might, this might also should be a C. I'm no, I mean, I, I think this is a little bit strange because like for, say for instance, on the, on this, um, on this Galois side, it needs to be you know, like the Langlands dual. Yeah, so this is the thing. It's not exactly Langlands duality, right? Um, that comes later, that does not come from this construction. But what this construction is telling us is that these structures that we get from the Hitchin moduli space are very naturally associated to the sort of things we want to look at. Ultimately, it says we are heading in the right direction, okay. right? So it is a an optimistic little uh, boost of encouragement, I guess. Can I, can I also ask what's possibly a, an embarrassingly naive question? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I don't know if you or someone else might know, but so when you were earlier, you were talking about the hypercalar uh, quotient, and then before that, the, the easier version, which is the symplectic quotient, and you use this notation of having these two lines. So is this symplectic quotient, in some sense, properly interpreted a GIT quotient? Or that is exactly how it's interpreted. Uh, um, in fact, actually, I'm going to be talking about next is stability, um, which is, this is basically, it, it's probably best interpreted as the GIT notion of stability. But, so that's exactly what's going on here. Um, but I'm not going to do that with GIT stuff because that's complicated. Um, instead, Let's take a, a bit of a more lowbrow approach to this. So let's say we have a point in a manifold model group. What is its dimension? Well, well, well just by dimension counting, if this, is, if this lies on a manifold, then it has to be basically the degrees of freedom of m minus those of g that you're modding out. But what happens if x has a stabilizer and there's a continuous subgroup of these things that actually preserve x? Then when we do the degree of freedom counting, we see that the dimension at X has to be greater by the dimension of the stabilizer, which means that if X has a stabilizer, it can't possibly live in like a smooth moduli space, a smooth manifold moduli space, because then the, then the dimension wouldn't be well-defined and that's no good. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna basically cut out these points with a stabilizer. Um, so this is, this is actually the notion of simplicity, which is very similar to stability, but not quite the same. But anyway, the, the rule of thumb is 
When you have a stabilizer, it's because the underlying structure that you have actually splits apart. So for example, in the flat case for flat bundles, um, having a stabilizer uh, corresponds to, having a stabilizer corresponds to a splitting of your, of your basically of your holonomy, which corresponds to a splitting of your vector bundle into two sub vector bundles, which each only have holonomy living in, in, in themselves, right? So that splitting allows you to create these continuous gauge transformations on it, which gives you the stabilizer, which is bad. Analogously, in the Higgs case, we're looking at holomorphic subbundles of some vector bundle E. We're assuming it's a vector bundle instead of a G bundle for convenience, mostly. That is supposed to be an E. Um, and these always exist, but there's a the condition that they have to satisfy something called slope stability, which says that basically the normalized churn number, normalized degree of our vector bundle. Oh, that should be L. I don't know why. I'm sorry. That should be E. The normalized degree of our vector bundle has to always decrease under this. Um, and ultimately, like the, the reason behind this, this formula is that it tells us whether or not, um, if we're trying to split our holomorphic structure into two parts, there's a second fundamental form that's like living, living, living in this area here. And this degree stuff ultimately tells you whether or not that cohomologically has to be zero or not. And that tells you whether or not you can split it. I think that's what's going on. But the reason I'm not being very precise about this is that ultimately stability isn't all that conceptually important, which is kind of weird because it's one of the first things anyone teaches you about when you're doing Higgs bundles. But for the most part, you can kind of black box it as basically Semi-stability is the, it's the superscript we put on, on top of our moduli space to turn the bad thing into the good thing. Um, and if we think about it like that, I mean, at least for our purposes, that's gonna be perfectly fine. But just to, just to, just to see what these, uh, let's, let's look at what these, um, these new manifolds actually look like. Oh, there you go, see how happy they are? See, we on, our, on, our, on the irreducible, when we imposed irreducibility, we got rid of the, the singular point of the variety here, and all of the sharp teeth are gone here. And in the semi-stable case, again, we got rid of all of the yucky, the yucky bad parts up here. So now they're actually smooth manifolds, and now they are indeed diffeomorphic. And this is the proper statement of non-abelian Hodge correspondence I was saying earlier, because when there are singularities, then they kind of mess things up. But it's, just, it's, it's nice to have, it's nice to notice, know that this is here, gives us security. But to actually, so we're gonna to need to actually take on another different perspective on this space. And this is what we're gonna, we're gonna be using basically a spectral curve. So here's the idea. A Higgs bundle is an adjoint valued, it's a bit, or sorry, let's consider the group GLN. So that our so that basically our Higgs bundle instead of being adjoint valued something it's it's an endomorphism valued one form. Let's just kind of forget about the one form part and just look at the endomorphism sitting above any given point, right? So over this point, let's say the endomorphism looks like this, and it has eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So the flow it has invariant lines and stuff like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each line up here, look at its eigen and we plot, we plot it basically up at the length, at the, at the, at the size of its eigenvalue, right? Um, so uh, we have the, like this line goes up here and then this other line, which is a smaller eigenvalue, in fact, it's negative, this one goes down here. And then as we vary the, the, the um, as we vary over the, over the curve C, this basically these lines trace out a line bundle. It's kind of what we see here, it's tracing out a line bundle. And this is so useful because it basically gives us the, it gives us, um, it splits the spectral information into half. It splits it into the information of an eigenvectors, which is contained in the actual shape of this spectral curve here, which is like the curve of eigenvec eigenvalues over a thing, and the data of the eigenvalues, which correspond to a line bundle over this curve. And again, 
it's a line bundle of Ricoeur, so we can just think of these as living in, as a point in the Jacobian of our curve. There we go, Jacobian of, a, of our curve C. Um, I'm being a little bit incorrect here. The proper way to do this um, is to actually take, let's look at, instead of just um, finding the, the eigenvalues of, of the matrix itself, let's look at the characteristic polynomial of our matrix. And this expands out, and then each of the terms in this corresponds effectively to an invariant polynomial under the adjoint representation of our group. Um, and this equation here cuts out. It's a it's an equation in the total space of the of the canonical bundle to the nth power, and this cuts out a variety inside of it. And, and this c tilde is the actual spectral curve, and it's an n sheeted cover of our curve down here. And you don't get any yucky um, like eigenvalue crossings or stuff like that. The only reason you get stuff like this happening where it's it's not a curve is because we, we're taking a projection basically to a bad space. So this is our spectral curve. This sort of encodes with the spectral data of our bundle. But how do we generalize this to things that aren't just you know, GLN? Well, ultimately, we end up getting is what's called the Hitchin vibration, um, where each point in the base, basically, each point in the base is, sorry, start from the space of Higgs bundles. And then what we're doing is we're taking the basis of essentially invariant polynomials in, in G, which corresponds to the coefficients of our characteristic polynomial. And the essentially the, the, the values of all of those invariant polynomials that, that gives you the data of the eigenvalues equivalently. So we can, we can live it in the space of essentially a bunch of sums of the space of sections of different powers of the canonical bundle. But the idea is for most of it, it's, um, we look at this like a point on the base basically corresponds to a given spectral curve. And over it, we have all of the eigen line bundle data, which corresponds to an abelian variety, like the Jacobian. Of course, things get messy when you have, um, when this curve you defined in, in the spectral curve you defined has singularities. And then you get what's called the discriminant locus. And above here, the fibers aren't just tori or degenerate tori. So as you kind of as you kind of get closer to the center and get more and more discriminant, these things get more and more and more complicated, um, and it's all very interesting. But for the most part, we're we're just going to care about the, the the regular parts where everything is simple, right? So another interesting fact about this, right? Let me let me say some facts about the fibers. So first off, they're abelian, as I said. Um, in the case of GLN, they were line bundles. Uh, they were they were basically Jacobians. But in general, it's more it's something called a prim variety, which is something you get. It's 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 a, it's a thing that's cut out out of the Jacobian. Um, it's a slight change. Um, and then these are actually all Lagrangian. So Lagrangian means that the symplectic form when reduced onto the surface of one of these fibers is zero. And it also means it's the maximal, dimi maximal dimension where that is the case, which in this case, it basically corresponds to being half dimensional. So half of the dimension is sitting here on the base and half of it is sitting in the fibers. That's what I meant by it splits the spectral data in half. It's kind of remarkable that this actually works out this way because you wouldn't really expect that, the reason that you know that these, um, that it splits the dimension in half is that you just basically you can compute the dimension of the modular space of Higgs bundles with some Atiyah Singer argument, and then you can compute the dimension of the base by just some like classical algebraic geometry arguments, and then you just happen to find that this is half of that. So in Hitchens' original paper, he called this a numerical miracle. But what's especially cool about this is that it is an algebraically completely integrable system, which means that the um, Hamiltonians defined on defined by the coordinates on the base 
all commute with each other. So the flow that they generate is just going to live on the torus and it's just gonna be really simple. It's just gonna be looping around the torus like that. So that means that the dynamics on this are really nice and you can actually describe a bunch of other integral systems as Hitchin systems. But where this plays into our story is that since it is a Hamiltonian system, you can try quantizing it. And this is done by Bellison and Drinfield. Effectively, you find that in the process of this quantization, you get Hecke operators. And this corresponds to another different, another different story of relating all of this stuff to um, geometric lengths. It's kind of un, it's kind of separate from the one I'm going to be describing. But I don't know. I thought that was really cool. So here is where Langlands comes in. What do Langlands dual Hitchin spaces look like? Okay, let me just remind you what the Langlands dual actually is. It's where we swap the roots and the co-roots. So basically, our roots are living inside the Carton subalgebra of our group, and let data find some lattice. And as we take any bilinear form, and we, we basically can swap to the dual Carton, right? And then basically the long ones become short and short one becomes long. And that's the swapping between roots and co-roots. So, Yeah, so then once you once you expand this out back into the level of groups, and this is the Langlands group G, this is the group G, and this is the Langlands dual. Now, the interesting fact is that the space of invariant polynomials on these guys is actually exactly the same. Because, well, first we use a theorem of Chevalier. Um, so we use the normal uh, the normal MO of Lie theory, where basically we can study invariance and their conjugation on the whole Lie group as just things on the maximal torus that are invariant under the Weyl group. Um, and in the infinitesimal form, this takes the form as invariant polynomials under the whole group G, or just invariant polynomials of the Carton subalgebra, which is the Lie algebra of the maximal torus that are invariant under the Weyl group. And then we take any bilinear form and we send this to its dual. And by sending it to its dual, we're sending the roots to their co-roots. And then we apply Chevalier's again. And then we, um, the, the thing we end up getting is the Lingwin's dual on the other side. So basically, this says the invariant polynomials on of G and of the Lingwin's dual of G are the same. They're isomorphic. And keep in mind, these are what defined the map to the base of the Hitchin vibration. So this says that the base of the Hitchin vibration is the same for the group G and its Langlands dual. So let's kind of represent it like this. Um, so here we have the, the one of the group G and the other one of the, of the Langlands dual and they both, they both fiber over the same base, right? So let's look a little bit about what the actual structure of these fibers is. How do they relate to each other? This actually, goes into T-duality. So the fibers, the relation to each other is that the fibers are actually dual abelian varieties, which means that one of them parameterizes the space of line, but it's on the other and vice versa. So for example, in the, in the GLN case, we have that both of these were, um, they're both Jacobians over the curve. And essentially this, this fact amounts to the fact that it, the Jacobians of any smooth curve, specifically the spectral curve in our case, are all are always self-dual. But right, so this the way that this sort of I don't know a good way to explain why morally that these being dual varieties relates to like the definition of the Langlands dual, but maybe you could say it like this. So the relationship of a dual torus of a torus to its dual take, is given by basically you consider it as as modding out by a lattice and then sending the lattice to its dual. And sending lattice to its dual is done by choosing some bilinear form. And essentially this is analogous to the thing that we did in our in the last slide where we sent the Carton subalgebra to its dual and that interchanged roots and co-roots. So something like that is what's going on here, which basically says that why switching to a dual variety basically roughly switches the roots and the co-roots. Anyway, so what does this actually look like? Well, it 
this duality is essentially it's the same as a Fourier transform. So I like to think about it as position and momentum space. So you position space here, and then you take the Fourier transform, which is the same as taking the space of line bundles effectively, and you get into the momentum space. And uh, the idea is lengths on here go to one over lengths on here, basically. It inverts the lengths of all of them. And that is the usual statement of t-duality. So t-duality, meaning target space duality, you go from a curve uh, to a space with basically some radius r, and that's actually dual to the theory of the space with some radius 1 over r. Yeah, and so this is exactly what we found in our case, where we use s-duality to show that these two things actually yield dual theories, and these two things are related by t-duality because they're dual varieties. So this all plays together into basically the story of SYZ mirror symmetry. That's what this is an example of. So just a quick reminder, I talked about this um, last semester, but mirror symmetry is effectively, from the physics perspective, it is a duality between sigma models, nonlinear sigma models, where the target X should be isomorphic as a sigma model to basically the mirror of the target. But from a mathematical perspective, the better sort of model to think about mirror symmetry is that it takes symplectic data on the manifold to complex data on, it, on its mirror, right? Now, in the case of S-duality, we found that basically by going through this whole compactification argument and all of that, we found that, and then using this, um, this T-duality, we found that this manifested as different, basically, sigma models on, on the moduli space of Hitchin, on Hitchin's moduli space and that of its Langlands dual are isomorphic. This kind of indicates that they should be mirror duals of each other. And in fact, they are. And this, this falls under the, basically the motto and the paper title you use is that mirror symmetry is T-duality. That is the idea of SYZ mirror symmetry. So you have a base B, and you have two separate fibers over B. Um, what factors do we need the fibers to have? Well, well basically, they're torus vibrations, specifically Lagrangian torus vibrations. So that means, in particular, they're half to dimension. Um, and we want the fibers to be dual to one another. That's the T duality. We also need we need the condition that they're special um, Lagrangians. So the technical definition of a special Lagrangian is one where Basically, these are complex n-dimensional manifolds. So there's like a real n form, and then it's kind of like a volume form. And if you restrict that to the fibers, then it is zero. That's what it means to be special. But how I think of it is basically, this is a condition you can apply to, that really rigidifies things. It means the space of these special vibrations is, has some pretty interesting stuff. For example, any special Lagrangian has to be area minimizing in its cohomological class. So you can see already how rigid the structure of being a special vibration is. And it's really hard to find actually special vibrations because also mirror symmetry in general is hard. So yeah, so we have this base B and this corresponds in our, in our, in our picture with the Higgs bundles um, that these two, the, the, the Higgs bundle and that of its Langman stool are these basically the the SYZ mirrors of each other. And the main conjecture of SYZ mirror symmetry is that essentially Clavio free folds, all mirror, all mirror pairs come from this vibration. Well, they actually only stated it in terms of free folds because that's what physicists like to talk about, I guess. But I think it's a more general conjecture than that. So, Let's kind of, let's summarize the story. How did we get here? What sort of happened? Right, so we started with S-duality. There we go. We started with S-duality um, on uh, 40 super yang mill spheres. And then we did dimensional reduction. We got that to Hitchens equations and then saw through the non abelian Hodge correspondence that this actually gave you things that were really close to geometric Lehman stuff. And then we um, use the actual Langlands dual uh, Hitchin vibrations 
and that manifested itself as T duality, as S Y Z duality, right? S Y Z mirror symmetry. So we've basically realized S duality through T duality as mirror symmetry. And why is this so exciting? Basically, all of the pieces we have are falling into place, right? We have we have all of this stuff built up about geometric Langlands conjecture and what's going on, on that side with a bunch of category things, which Stephen talked about. Then we have the S duality and this reduction to mirror symmetry. And mirror symmetry is so exciting because like the moduli space, like Hitchens moduli space, it takes many different forms. And that means that we can use that the idea that these dual vibrations are mirrored to each other and look at it in the different formulations of mirror symmetry and get new information from that. In particular, we have the perfect thing, which is a categorical formulation of mirror symmetry, which is homological mirror symmetry. It was Constavich in 1994 first proposed it. But that's a spoiler for next week. So I guess that's all I have for today. If there's any questions. Yeah, one thing that I just wanted to ask. So at the very beginning, when we were in this, you were trying to explain some sort of physical motivation for why we need to do the dimensional reduction at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So so to be honest, I, I, never really, I never really understood what physicists really are talking about when they say this. So why, why does it make, why were we reduced into two dimensions? So yeah, could you say so, a little bit? Yeah. OK. So the thing that physicists, well, popular physics always says about dimensional reduction is that they have tiny dimensions that are curled up in little balls that are everywhere. I never understood what that meant. But basically, I think the idea behind dimensional reduction is that we can form the theories that, that, that govern our life in four dimensions can be formed as basically low energy effective theories of some underlying theory. And that underlying theory lives in higher dimensions. The issue is these higher dimensions, uh, what we're doing is we're um, taking the metric on the extra parts of the dimensions to be really small. That's what, and by doing that, we're basically forcing any modes there to be much higher energy. That basically forces the low energy approximation to be a dimensional reduction of, I guess, like, uh, of the original theory, right? Um, Yeah, hopefully that kind of helps. Yeah, that definitely helps in the general thing, but like, at, like, why is it two? Like, why don't we reduce to like say three or one? Oh, okay, in this case, well, yeah. one answer is it gives you the Hitchin equations, but there's a better answer, which uses actually brains. So I'm gonna introduce these next week, but basically this is a topological field theory, but in particular, it's an extended topological field theory, which means that we can associate to, uh, to, a free, to a free manifold, we associate a vector space. To a two manifold, we associate a category. To one manifold, we associate a two category. So, so on and so forth. And the reason why we have to reduce from four to two is because we, this, this is what the geometric Langlands conjecture is, is it's a conjecture about categories. So we need two dimensions because that's where you get categories and not one categories or like two categories or anything. Hence, you're doing that. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, right. So I mean, it, it seems that in the modern formulation of the geometric Langlands conjecture, I mean, it, it, act, it really is actually a, like a proclaimed equivalence of infinity one categories, so somehow. I do not know what that means, so I cannot comment. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I mean, I guess at some point, somehow the physics needs to explain this as, as well, I suppose. Okay, in any case, thank you. That was very helpful. So, are there any other questions?
maybe I can just give a little bit of a teaser for next time and just kind of summarize what I'm going to be talking about uh, quickly for a couple minutes. Um, so I'm going to be introducing basically brains, which are um, the elements, which are physics interpretation of this categorical interpretation of topological quantum field theory. And this is how we're going to manifest actually the mirror symmetry as, as, a, as an equivalence of categories. Is this going to be talking about categories of brains? Um, basically, one of the categories you get from the from mirror symmetry corresponds exactly to one from geometric Langlands, but the other one is it's, it's, the, it's the Fukaya category. It's this hard category about Lagrangian submanifolds and such. But basically, that is it gives a different perspective. It's basically conjecturally, it is a different way to think about to go about. Um, looking at the, I think, the derived category on the, on the, on the space of bundles. Um, I might be wrong about that. But that's basically where we're going to go is, is um, we get this equivalence of categories on one side, on the other side, they're not equivalent, and we're going to try to make a map between them. And that's going to sort of be the physics stuff going into, going into this. I should also mention maybe that this stuff is actually useful um, in real life because um, the fundamental lemma, which is a statement that I do not actually know, but something important in geometric Langlands or just Langlands conjecture in general, was proved using these modulized of Higgs, Higgs bundles, these Higgs systems, right? Um, yeah, and that one. I want to feel its metal. So obviously it's in some important work going on here. I thought that was it's a pretty cool example of why you might care about this, even if you aren't a physicist. So if there's nothing else, I can stop screen sharing. <laughs>